Hi there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to yet another cracking installment of The Matt Brown Show. Today, I'm joined by Andrea Waltz. Welcome, Andrea. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. No, the privilege is all mine. Hey, so uh, you've written this book. I'll uh, bring it up on screen for everybody. Uh, yep called uh, Go For No. <laughs> She's also holding up a copy for those of you on the audio. Uh, <laughs> yes is the destination, no is how you get there. So I'm uh, very, very interested in unpacking this all for our viewers around the world. Andrea, I mean, your book's got like 4,000 five-star reviews. It's, uh, it's a real big thing. You do a lot of speaking off the back of it. So it's a huge, huge, hugely valuable topic to, to share today. So thank you for being here. Um, so Andrea, you know, for, for those of us who haven't read your book, and don't know what you're about, um, why don't you kick us off, Black? Where does the story begin? Yeah, so the story begins uh, when I was in school, got a bachelor's of science degree in criminal justice. In the meantime, I was working for a company called Lens Crafters. It's a big eyeglass retailer in the United States. And that's where I met my now husband who told me the go for no story. And after he told this story to me, I realized that I didn't like to hear the word no, and that it was my fear of the word no and my dislike for it was holding me back. And eventually what we did was uh, he convinced me that we should quit our nice, safe, comfortable jobs and start our company, start a speaking and training company, um, teaching this go for no philosophy. And I was just naive and young enough to do it. I figured I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. So that's what we did. And um, uh, had some failures along the way, for sure. Um, after 9-11, I had to go back and get a job for a year and a half just because business was obviously it was, it was so bad. And um, but yeah, I have a super passion for teaching people, and this is all I do, teaching people how to reprogram the way they think and feel when it comes to hearing the word no in their business or in their life in any way. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting. It's, um, <laughs> it's not uh, often that you find a husband and wife couple that have built an empire <laughs> around one idea and are still married. Yeah, exactly. Well, we learned early on, uh, just as an aside for anybody who does work with their significant other, that you have to learn uh, how to give up control and how to split right responsibilities. And you just don't have to have your hands on everything. And also, uh, we also learned, my husband, I think more than me, that sometimes changing something doesn't necessarily make it better. It just makes it different. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think uh, my wife also worked with me in my previous business. Um, and I can say that um, I, I, I feel like it's something everyone should actually do. You know what I mean? Like the no thing is like, I'm never working with my husband. He's this, he's like this, like he would be, I would be miserable. Um, and then I was also like very reluctant and so was she. And um, and so we worked together for, you know, four years in the same business. So it was a, it was a weird one where she was going to do her own consulting thing and then COVID happened. And then, you know, I was like, well, just, you know, I need help. So you come in and it was kind of like forced to happen. And it was the best thing that ever happened. And one of the things that, um, that was really great about it was I don't need to necessarily overshare what I'm going through as an entrepreneur with my wife, if she's in the business, because she's feeling it too. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes. You really, um, there's a saying that it, that goes, um, never think alone. And when you have your significant other with you, you don't think alone because you two are able to problem solve together, which is really cool. Yeah, it's amazing. So what's the premise for this, for this book, Go For No? And maybe, I know Richard's your husband, but, but I mean, like, was he, where did he, was it something that he was going through? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what's, what's the origin story behind the premise there? Yeah, exactly. So it's actually kind of a simple story. He was um, selling suits for a living. He uh, was failing miserably. And actually, the reason he was selling suits for a living, and let me back up, was um, he grew up in Chicago uh, selling uh, with his with his dad, who was like a legend in the car sales industry, not like retail car sales, but fleet, the fleet sales business. And um, he got into that business with his dad and was in it for a couple of years and just absolutely loved his dad, hated that business, and wanted to get out of his dad's sales legend shadow because everybody was watching Richard to see like, oh, would he be as successful as his father? So he left Chicago, he moved all the way to Los Angeles. He took a job selling suits and he was failing there as well. So he was kind of freaking out, like, what am I gonna do? I can't go back to Chicago. I don't, you know, I don't wanna 
want to go back there. And especially because everybody said, oh, you're not going to make it out in California. You're going to fail and you're going to end up coming home. So uh, one day, the district manager, this guy named Harold, was scheduled to come visit the store. And Richard was hoping that he could impress Harold on this store visit. So on this particular day, um, Harold's there. Everybody shows up. His customer walks in and announces he wants to buy an entire wardrobe of clothing. And Richard got to take care of this man. And he sold this man a suit and a sport coat and shirt, slacks, ties. He had this great sale. Now this goes back now like <laughs> a, couple, a few decades now. Um, but he had this $1,100 sale. So if in today's dollars, it would probably be like five grand. So he has this great sale. He's all proud of himself. And then Harold finally comes up to Richard and he says, hey, that was a great sale. And Richard's thinking that he impressed Harold, except that Harold asks him this life-changing question. Harold says, Richard, um, do you mind if I ask you a question? And Richard's like, sure. And he goes, out of curiosity, what did that customer say no to? And Rich is kind of taken aback because he's thinking, I just had this amazing sale. And now Harold's asking me, what did the customer say no to? So he had to, he had to answer, which honestly was the customer didn't say no to anything. Everything that Richard laid in front of this guy, he purchased, he had this great sale. And then Harold asked him the other really important question, which was, well, then how did you know he was done? If he never said no to anything, how did, how did you know he was done? And Richard had to basically admit that, um, he just ended the sale. He was like, it got to $1,100, which was really uh, for Richard. He wasn't making a lot of money for him. That was like, okay, that's enough. You're done. Rang the customer up, sent him on his way. And Harold gave Richard this go for no advice. He said, you know, I watched you sell. You're not half bad, but your fear of the word no is going to kill you. I think if you could just learn to get over that, you could be, you know, a great salesperson. And so Richard made it his mission to stop fearing no. He said, I didn't know if I had what it took to succeed, but I knew I had what it took to fail. I could mm -hmm. fail more often. I could hear no more often. I could show more products to customers, have them say no, and be more successful. And that's exactly what he did. Um, and so fast forward about 15 years later, he's now telling me this story, Matt, and I have my own epiphany. Now, unlike Richard, I didn't, I didn't think I was a bad salesperson. I wasn't failing at all but I had to get honest with myself and realize that I didn't like to hear no either. And so that, that was really, that's the life-changing story. And that's a story that we have in the book. Um, the book's actually a fable, um, but we have the main character experience that, that scenario in the book. And it's from there that we launch off and talk about all of the other things related to having to hear no and, and, and asking. So um, Andrea, I'm curious at what point, did this become a calling for you? Because I think, and for your husband, because I think a, lo a lot of us have these ideas, like these epiphanies, but we don't actually act on them. You know what I'm saying? Like somewhere along the line, you were like, hey, this is a real problem. Like, uh, you know, the idea is it's like, this sucks for me, right? So yeah. I have an issue with no, um, and I need to get over that stuff, change the way I, you know, I feel about getting rejection, you know, rejected and what have you. And then at some point you connect it to like, well, should, does this suck for a lot of other people and then it's like oh snap you know there's a there's a moment when you go oh my gosh like i think this is actually something that i really want to go out into the world and solve for not just ourselves but for millions of people yeah um it was two things actually one um was uh even before this, like way before this happened, I stumbled upon a, a book called The Aladdin Factor, which is all about asking. And I was never a good asker. Like I was always afraid to ask because I was afraid of no. And so, th and that book really changed my mindset, but I never really did anything with it. Like it never, I don't know, sometimes you read a book and you're just not ready for it. Mm -hmm. And so when Richard told me this story, I realized that that was, what I had read in the Aladdin Factor um, about the power of asking. And, but I also recognized the brilliance of it. And now that I was more in the business world, I, I recognized like how easy it was to apply that. But still, even, even when we launched our company, we were teaching a bunch of other stuff. And it wasn't until our customers started saying like, oh, Forno's our favorite we, of everything that we would teach, like in a four hour workshop or an eight hour day, it was like, go for no was becoming the centerpiece more and more. So we were just kind of listening to what people were telling us. And um, I, I mean, I'm super, I was super passionate about the message, but when people like it, <laughs> then you get even more passionate, you're more excited, like, 
oh, people are people like this. People are into this. Um, you know, so that that was even more of the turning point where we we finally said, let's just focus on this message. Like, let's just does you know we've got all this other content, but let's just be specific on this message. And before we were focusing on an industry too. We were focusing focusing on the retail business, and now we really want to focus on anyone who had to face rejection. Mm. So um, I've been told on the show once that you know having a book is the best business card you'll ever write or ever have. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and Robbie Kelman backs that. Like wrote the Forever Customer and the Membership Economy, and she just positioned herself as this as this category queen in uh, subscription based businesses or with uh, businesses with uh, you know subscription commercial models. Um, and she consults to corporates and things like that. And she's, you know, she charges an absolute fortune because she's like this leader in this space. Um, what's your advice to a founder entrepreneur who wants to, um, you know, make a difference and contribute in the same way that you guys have to the world of humans <laughs> and businesses? Um, what's your advice to that founder when it comes to deciding on what to write about? Yeah, I think it's, you've got to write like your super authentic message and the thing that you just love and that you want to talk about. <laughs> I mean, that's the, th like, that's the thing. And, and, um, there's kind of a phrase in the speaking world, which is, um, and it was something that Richard actually shared with me years ago. So hopefully I won't screw this up, but it's basically like, um, say something new or say something different in a new way and um go for no like for example is not a new idea like the idea that you should try to that you should face rejection that you shouldn't be afraid of no we've all heard that we've all heard people give advice like don't take no personally we just packaged it in a slightly new way so i think don't be afraid to take your to put your spin on something that might feel like everybody talks about this but not necessarily in your way not with your stories or you may have some kind of totally new concept, um, which is amazing as well. But I think you just have to, you have to have the passion because you're going to face a lot of uphill battles. You're going to face a lot of rejection, and a lot of no's. And so the only way to push through that I've found is you just have to love that message. Matt, I hate to interrupt us, but mm. I wanted to ask you a question. Mm. You want me to hit the record button in Zoom? Do I need to be recording in Zoom? No, I'm doing it all this side. Good. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, it just occurred to me because yeah. I'm so used to seeing the little record button there. Um, I know. Yeah. But I think uh, th that's the thing is if you um, go into it like, hey, I'm just going to write this book and I don't really care about it. And it's just like one way, one income stream or whatever. For us, like you said, it is a business card and it's all about the it's not even about the book so much. It's about the message. Mm -hmm. And I heard Phil M. Jones talk about this just the other day. He said, he said, when you have a book, um, the book is just a vehicle for the message. You have to be the one sharing the message and then people will find the ways to engage with that message. And one of those ways is by getting the book. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's also quite interesting, um, this uh, the, the business model behind, because I interviewed like a lot of authors, like a lot, uh, New York Times bestselling authors, da, da, da. And it's amazing how, uh, Robbie Kelman being another one. It's amazing how Steve Blank. It's another. It's amazing how the commercial model. I, I really love the commercial model of authors. If you know, you, you become an author, a speaker, and then you get into like information products, uh, training, or and that kind of stuff. So we'll get into that with you with what you're doing. But essentially, what I've seen work really well is where you uh, you write the book, and that's like let's just say twenty dollars, right? That's that's where you get into the go for no you know, funnel if you like. Mm. And then what happens is you, you actually increase your prices based on access to you. So in other words, if you were doing like a group training thing, it's five grand or sorry, you know, 10 grand for speaking group training things, 50 K, you know, like if you want me to come in and like train your whole sales team, that's like 250 K. So the more access I get to you to a one-on-one -on -one level, like the more I pay. Um, is that a, is that a similar kind of approach that you've done to to commercialize this go for no empire of yours? In a way, um, but I will tell you, like, so I think sometimes different people identify them with with certain things about themselves, and that that dictates how they build their business. 
So Richard and I, from the beginning, I have never identified or seen myself as a coach at all or a consultant. Like I, I don't want to go into a company and, and dig in. Um, it's just not where I think my zone of genius is. We really have identified ourselves as first and foremost writers. Like if, if somebody said, you know, on the form, you know, when you're going into a new country on the passport form or whatever, like, what do you do on the tax form? What do you do? We're always like, what do we do? <laughs> um, writer for sure. Uh, speaker kind of second secondarily and so we haven't done that model as well as I think a lot of people do because we're not doing the the high ticket offers um, it's just stuff that we don't want to do I will say um, this year though I finally decided that I wanted to push myself out of my comfort zone and since I don't identify as a coach I said okay I'm going to start doing some some coaching because I want to test myself and see like is that identity where am i get where am, what story am i coming up with and why don't i want to do like personal one-on-one -on -one coaching um and so i'm doing group coaching to kind of push myself this year and it's actually taught me a lot and it's been a tremendous amount of fun but to your point about the funnel it's a it's an absolutely no-brainer model and i think that you just have to apply it in the ways that you know that you want to work Right. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. If you want to be a consultant, great. If you want to be a, a coach, if you want to have somebody hire you for a day for a hundred grand, great. Um, that's just not something that we, we like to go. We like to speak to a group of a thousand and leave. Uh -huh. Quick in, here's your perspective. Change your lives. Off you go. By the way, speaking of writers, have you heard of this book here? Uh, it's called Snow Leopard. It's written by uh, Chris Lockhead, Eddie, uh, Eddie Yoon, and Nicholas. Nicholas was the third guy. Um, but it's basically, a, you should absolutely read this book. I mean, or any writer, any entrepreneur, anybody doing content uh, should read it. It's called Snow Leopard, How Legendary Writers Create a Category of One. Um, and Chris, uh, I've been on his podcast. He's been on mine a couple of times. Um, and his book uh, is, again, number one, he's like 12 times bestseller, whatever. Anyway, um, but super smart guy. And, and he was writing about like, you know, this idea of connections. And you get like obvious connections and non-obvious uh, uh, non connections. So obvious connections is like, how do you go from A to B in like five steps? You know, you see all those articles, it's like clickbait. Mm -hmm. You think eight things you need to know about getting, you know, return on your ad spend. I mean, it's like, it's pretty obvious, very competitive. A lot of people can solve that problem. Um, and it's only valuable up until someone is it only it's only valuable as long as someone's answering or has the question that needs the answer. And then you've got non-obvious thinking, which is kind of where I believe you guys are because you've created this category of one um, is that it's where you're in the transformational business. It's where you get people to think about the change that they want to make. Right. So it's a fascinating uh, uh, book. Um, and they've also uh, gone into this like. Uh, sort of the access type model mm. where the more access you get the more it costs you it's a very very interesting book that's um, interesting i feel like i have heard i feel like i have heard of it but to your point about that you know what's funny is um you see people there's advice which is you know solve solve a problem that people know they have and i think most people out there know on some level that they have a fear of rejection like like most and some people like definitely know they have it some people say i could never sell or that's the thing about being in business i just hate the fact that i have to sell and um and so it's a very obvious thing but there's also the underlying thing like solve the solve the problem that people don't know they have mm. and that sometimes takes where people like that's one benefit of going into a go for no challenge is people experience, they, they, they get kind of pushed into the deep end of the pool, so to speak, and they have to start going for no, and then they start learning, this is why I'm procrastinating. This is why I have that call reluctance or email reluctance or message reluctance, take your pick, where they're not reaching out to people um, and going after like bigger, they're not playing bigger because they're just, they're not playing to win, they're playing not to lose. And so those problems, sometimes it's like, we're trying to help people find and discover that they actually have that problem, but they don't know it until they start doing it. Yeah, exactly. And that's a really, really great point um, because, you know, people sometimes don't know they have a particular problem. 
So when you can shine a light on that, then they go, oh, or it could be like, I have an obvious problem, but I, ha I need a non-obvious solution. Do you know yes, what I'm saying? Yes, yes, I like that. Yeah, it's very, very cool. So let, so this, the book, no, why is it a go for no? Why, why do you think it's, I mean, there's, there's, you know, tens of thousands of books out there. Why do you, th business books, why do you think your book has resonated so well with the world? I think three reasons. One, and we give people advice on this all the time. We wrote a book called Million Dollar Book Formula. So if you're looking to write, write and publish books and you want advice, that's another book that we wrote. I think keeping it short, it's 80 pages and people love short. I mean, look at what's happening in social media. Look how, how video has changed. It used to be you go on YouTube and, and the advice was make a 45 minute video or make an hour video. And now reels have taken off, right? People are taking their podcasts and they're cutting out um, just like this conversation with you. And, and people are cutting out, you know, 10 second, 15 second clips of wisdom because everybody wants short. Well, we realized that actually we kind of stumbled onto it more almost like an accident because when we first launched our business, we wrote uh, a book before Go For No called Retail Magic, and it was for retailers. Now, retailers who have a store are working 12 hour days from you know nine to nine, and they don't have time to read a, a 280 page book. They need something short. So our first book was 64 pages. And we just fell in love with the short book model. We said, you know what, we can communicate a few ideas. And that's the second thing is that I think makes go for no work is it's one idea. And sometimes, you know, you read a sales book or you read some kind of book and there's just, it, there's so many ideas. That's why all these businesses have sprung up, which is, hey, we'll distill this book down in 12 powerful ideas for you. Um, summaries.com, you know, they do book summaries because people don't have time to glean all of the information and all of the good ideas from these large books. So that's the second, that's the second reason. And then the third reason really is that it's a fable. And the fact that I think it, it just mixes it up a little bit. One of the criticisms of the book, which I totally get, I, I totally buy into is we start off with character development. Like you have to, you have to start to like the character. Otherwise you won't care to watch him go through what he goes through and, and you won't want to finish the story. So a lot of people get into it and they're like, why am I watching this, this mediocre copier sales guy take out the trash, talk to his wife, blah, 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 go on a golf outing. This is boring. Where, what's the point? Well, the point is we have to, we have to have you at least identify and start rooting for this character a little bit and see yourself in him so that we can get that transformation. Um, so the criticism of the book is, wow, I didn't see where it was going. By chapter three, I was getting kind of frustrated. And then by chapter five, I had like the epiphany of, oh, okay, I see there's going to be some learning in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I'm so, 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 so glad. <laughs> He's so glad you mentioned this, this short book format because like my my book um, I wrote uh, and it wasn't about like one idea. It was about, I can't do one. Like I don't do one very well. Mm -hmm. I do must, I'm a visionary. So I must do like many things at a time. And my wife's always like, Math Matthew, just like be pragmatic. Like you're always in the sky, you know? So like my book was um, was about 12 uh, principles for high impact entrepreneurs. Um, and when I, like my publisher, I said, she said to me, no, it's got to be 50,000 words. And I'm like, dude, like I don't have time to write a 50,000 word book. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's a, it's a lot of time. Like I don't have time. And she, you know, Tracy McDonald, she only publishes um, entrepreneur um, books from entrepreneurs basically. Um, and, and anyway, I did it. But now I've got this other friend of mine, Rich Mulholland. He speaks all over the world, also a speaker. He runs a presentation uh, firm, so he helps speakers suck less at speaking or leaders sucking, you know, to suck mm -hmm. less at the t speaking to the teams. So he speaks all over the world and stuff. Um, and he also has that similar, idea, uh, s similar uh, sort of mandate where he's like, dude, like, why are we writing these 80,000 word books that no one has time to read? It's like, yeah. give me one idea, package it well, give me, uh, you know, put the structure in the story in such a way that the idea will land and then I can run with it. I can apply it. Do you know what I mean? Oh, like the, absolutely. It's like this, this idea of, it's like, it's almost like this industrial age kind of like book publishing thing. I don't know where it even came from. Or how, like, but I know it's been around for ages. Like Tim Ferriss's book, Tools of Titan. Like that thing was absolutely massive. Couldn't read it. I could not actually read it because it was like, it was too much information. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Too many oh. ideas. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Tim's almost, it's, it's, 
yeah, his book is almost the exact, op- it's so big that what you have to do is you, you almost have to not think of it as a book. You have to yeah. think of it as like an encyclopedia and go like, I'm going to take, I'm going to read one of the, of the little chapters. Um, Cause he has all the Titans in this book. I'll read one and then let me see what I can do with it for a week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly exactly so um and then uh, the other thing i wanted to talk to you about was um the structure of story because i think it's a it's a very important thing like if you're selling anything there's like you know there's a structure in a cold email there's a structure in your uh, presentation so rich does this structure where it's like care believe no do so give mm-hmm. them reasons to care you know give them reasons to believe tell them what they need to know and give them something to do um, and then there's, you know, there's uh, the story brand idea where, you know, characters, transformation, guides, all that kind of stuff. So there's a structure in story. Um, what's the other one? Uh, the hero's journey. Um, yes. You know, another one is a structure in the story. Um, so, and but, you know, there's many types of structures. So if what's your advice to like a founder, entrepreneur, or even a writer listening to us or, or somebody who wants to write about how to approach thinking or one idea and to package it in a structure and a story that will resonate with, you know, the, the audiences that they're trying to make a difference to. So I like that you use the word package and that's always the tricky part for us, which is like we're right now we're writing um, a, a book. It's not a sequel to Go For No, but it is a follow up. And we've been I've been begging Richard to to do this for years and <laughs> to write like another kind of Go For No ish book. So we're taking Go For No to the next level and it's not going to be a fable. So packaging that is a little is a little easier but we help i mean we we have helped a lot of people write and and publish books and the packaging is always the key and you always want to tell your story the question is how do you tell your story do you tell your story all at once in the very beginning do you tell a story and break it apart and put lessons into it that's kind of my favorite way um we did a book um with a guy named jeff alt gilbers and his book's called um reaching the peak and it was about how he just was absolutely like li- dirt poor, like so broke. You just like broker than broke. <laughs> and and uh, how he just through sheer will and persistence and not giving up, um, eventually became a multimillionaire in this business. But he had so many failures and he and I mean, it was just constant. And so we the way we told the story was we just told his narrative from you know being kind of young to um and all of the stuff that he went through in his business and then embedded the lessons throughout that book so i think the key thing though the key thing that's so important is to tell stories get down into the details of them so that people people want to see i think um, they want to, they want to identify, they want to see themselves in that person because Jeff's story, it's great that Jeff did that. And it's great that he's a multimillionaire, but what we want is we want to see ourselves in Jeff to say, if Jeff could do it and he's not even, he's not educated, he didn't even finish high school. Like, so if he can do it and I di- and I am, you know, I graduated from high school and I have a college degree, then surely I can pull something off. Right. And so identifying with that character is really, I think, the most important thing to start off with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's really, really great. So, so go for no. I mean, I, I'm always curious to ask authors this because, you know, when you write an idea like go, a book about go for no, dealing with rejection of the kind of stuff, um, like, uh, and, and even entrepreneurs, it's like, you know, you think you're in the media business, like or the Matt Brown show, for instance, like you think you're in the, the podcasting business, mm-hmm. but actually I'm in the storytelling business. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a mm-hmm. there's a thing you think you're in, but then there's the business you're really in. So <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? So your book, Go For No, what do you, what would you say is the business you're really in? Yeah, we're I love this question. Um, and I've I, I have kind of two thoughts about this. I feel like we're in the courage business. I feel like we sell courage. That's what we sell ultimately. I want people to, in the moment that they start talking themselves out of doing something, and usually it and and it has to do mostly with asking, that in that moment they decide, hey, go for no. That's the that's the phrase I want to set off in their mind. And the great thing about go for no is once you read it, this is a bell that can't be unrung. Like once you read it, you're equipped. All it takes is your willingness to have the courage to do it and your willingness to fail 
if that person says no. And that changes everything. So for us, um, it is transformation. As you said earlier, Matt, it's, it's selling people something that they need more of, but ultimately it's, it's inside them. We just have to bring it out of them. Mm. Yeah. So let's talk about the practical stuff. So I know you've got uh, another, a challenge, a 21 day uh, challenge. Um, I think it's also another book, right? Let me bring it up for everybody here. So what is this go for no 21 day challenge? Cause I think, you know, taking this idea of go for no and applying it in the real world is where I think, uh, you know, our audience is going to really get a lot of what, what you're trying to get across. So what is the 21 day challenge? What do we need to know? So it's all about application. Um, and I even co I was even talking to my group uh, Tuesday because we just started, we, d I, we do an introductory call on Tuesday and I was telling them, you know, sometimes what you do is you sit back and you want all the training, give me all the training, all the training, and then I'll go out and I'll do it. The 21 day challenge is actually the opposite. I'm pushing people out and saying, go out and start collecting no's. And then we meet once a week and I, I give them some things to think about every day as well. We don't meet every day, but we meet once a week and talk about what the experiences were with going out and collecting more no's. So you've heard the go for no story about Richard um, learning that he needed to go for no, that he needed to hear no more often. So that's really what the challenge is. We created that workbook during the pandemic, actually, because we're sitting around with nothing to do like everybody else. And we said, well, let's... Um, we'd always suggested that people do a go for no challenge. So we, we decided let's bring it to life. Let's, let's design a tracking sheet. We designed a really cool tracking sheet. Uh, people track their business nose. They also track personal nose every day. And uh, we have the, a little area for them to write in what we call the big fish. So it's that big, scary person that they haven't wanted to go after. And there's a bunch of other things you can, you write down your effort rating and different things. And, and because we're old school, this is in a workbook form. So it's not something on your phone. It's not a cool app. I'm sorry to say you're actually, it's pen and paper with this workbook. Uh, but then the, the coaching group that I developed is where we all share experiences. And that's the really cool thing is you, you realize you're not the only one experiencing rejection. You're all, not the only one who's nervous, who feels awkward, who's afraid of what other people will think. And so we talk through all of those feelings because that's really what this thing comes down to is we would all take action all the time. We would just be nothing but action takers. It would be like, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. The problem is we're all scared. Mm. And mostly we're all scared of what other people think and messing up, failing, looking like idiots. And again, what other people will think. So the challenge is just going out and whatever business you're in, figuring out who you're going to go for no with, where, when, and what your big ask is. So for you, Matt, if you were in a challenge, I would, you know, um, everybody picks their own thing, but you could come on and say, okay, well, I'm gonna, my go for no challenges, I'm just gonna go after really high profile guests. So I'm gonna call Joe, I'm gonna reach out to Joe Rogan, and I'm gonna DM Elon Musk, and I'm gonna reach out to all these people. And you might think, well, you're not gonna get Elon Musk. Yeah, probably not. So go for no, like count mm -hmm. that as a no, if he doesn't respond um, or any, and, and, and it's a bad example because he probably won't respond. So we, we actually do count no's, but um, you know, anybody who's like a high profile person, go for no, go for no, make those asks. And, and that's how you would do a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, just to maybe stick with this a little bit and double click on it. So I think there's the no's you get from the world and then there's the no's you give yourself. So those are very distinct things. So for instance, let's use the map around show as an example. So I actually have like a list of people like <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that I need to hit. I just haven't got to it. But if I don't give myself permission to actually start, in other words, I think a lot of people, especially, you know, imposter syndrome, fear of failure, rejection and stuff, um, is that they, you don't even start. Like, I mean, it's, you know, like the amount of people that, that have come to me over the last eight years that I've said, hey, Matt, like, should I start a podcast? And I'm like, yes, do it. Go and do it. And then they're like, yeah, but there's two million podcasts out there. I'm like, yeah, but no one's going to do a podcast like you. Just start. Um, and it, like I would say a large percentage of, let's just say, seven out of ten of these uh, individuals don't start. Like they don't actually give themselves permission to start. How do you resolve that? 
Yeah. So um, first of all, I love what you said. You're absolutely right. There's the nose that we get externally and there's the nose we give ourselves, which actually it's funny that you bring that up because a woman in the challenge said that at the very end of our call, she said, I realize I'm, I give myself nose all the time. She goes, I should start counting those. I said, yeah, you add that to your tracking sheet. You should just start counting those and then and then obviously turn that around and, and ask. Um, the answer, Matt, that we give is you have to change your mental model of failure and success. We talk about failure a lot in Go For No in the book. It's really the underlying philosophy of Go For No. It's you've got to fall in love with failing. And and we don't sugarcoat it. Like, oh, some people have come to me over the years. They message me on LinkedIn or whatever. And I don't think you should use the word failure. Yeah, we absolutely use the word failure because failure should not, as a word, should not hold power over you. We shouldn't be scared to use it. That's where we are now as a society. Nobody wants to fail. Everybody hates the word. Everybody wants to change the word. Let's talk about challenge and opportunity, whatever. That's fine. If you want to change the word, great. You do you. We use failure. And we tell people embrace failure. I had a guy in challenge who was so, he was struggling so much. And I could tell because he never, he never would talk about what was really going on. He was never going for no, he just was, had so much fear. And I said, I hope that you, he's like, oh, I'm gonna try going for no, I don't want, I wanna try to get a yes. And I'm like, yeah, yes is the destination. That's the subtitle of our book. But I said, I hope you like go out and totally fall on your face and just have a huge failure because that's gonna be better for you. That's how you build resilience. You need to experience that, realize it didn't kill you, stand up and go for it again. It's the always trying to protect ourselves, always trying not to fail. That is what builds that fear. So in this challenge, we basically tell people, you gotta reparent yourself. You gotta be that parent with that kid going like, ride your bike, fall over, fall on your face, it's okay. Um, you just, that's how it works. That, that is the only way it works is that you have to embrace failure. Mm. I, uh, I think it was Elon Musk. I think he put this tweet out, but he, a while back, but it was basically, he said, all things being equal, I'd rather learn from success than learn from failure. Mm. It's an, it's an interesting idea, right? Because I, I, I hate failure. I hate, I hate the way it feels. Um, and, and, you know, many people also like hate the word no, Mm -hmm. um, and I know it's necessary, like failure is a prerequisite for success. I get that. Um, but I think like there's this thing like, what about the yes? Like you should be like, your next book should be about the yes game. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's the other thing. It's the other world because it's like, well, how do we get there? Like how do we, what's the simple idea to get to yes? Like go for no, but here's how you get to yes. Do you know what I mean? Like I know they're related. I know exactly what you mean. So it, and, and so in our world, how you get to yes is you just, you, you are more willing and you embrace no to such an extent that you get to yes that way. I mean, you detach from the outcome and you focus on the behaviors of, if you're in sales, collecting decisions, if you're an actor, right? Any actor, they don't go on one audition, one audition and go like, okay, well, I got to know, or one audition, okay, I got a yes, I'm done. They go on hundreds and hundreds of auditions because they know that that is how they get their yeses. So in some ways, it's a quantity game, which is you need to up the number of asks that you're making in any category. And simultaneously, as you're doing that, um, work on the quality, get better. The problem is a lot of people, what they wanna do is they wanna work on the quality to such an extent, they don't ask anybody. They wanna work on that quality, 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 perfect email, perfect presentation, and then have that convert to a yes without ever going through the pain of working through it and sending those things out and going through the nose. We would rather have people up their quantity first and then develop the quantity as they go. And that's ultimately, I think, how you get to yes. Mm. I think to your point around trying to control the outcome, like that's a really big deal, you know, and I don't think people are, a lot of people are actually aware about how much they're trying to control the outcome. So for instance, if you want to make a million dollars of sales in a year or whatever your number is, pick your number, um, then you try and control the outcomes to get to the number. Whereas, and, and, you know, trying to do that, by the way, it just ruins your life. Like you get into like, your confidence starts to erode, uh, you know, uh, you, you doubt what you're doing, fear starts to really, you know, become a daily thing for you, most of your days suck, 
you have more bad days than you have good days because your entire mindset is about focusing on the outcome, right? Like the yeah. like the no, the no, the no, no, whatever. But actually to get to the no, the thing that drives the no in the first place is this activity set, right? So how many inputs are you executing on a daily basis? Like how many activities? And so if you if you shift your focus from the external outcome and towards your internal you're like here's as much as I can get done today. This is what success looks like for Matt Brown, for you know, for Andrea Waltz, for who, for the whoever is listening to us right now. This is what success looks like for me for today. And you may not get to like a hundred percent of that goal like every day in terms of activities because you know what shit happens. I got two kids. I was like a bit late for this podcast. Stuff happens. You know what I mean? So sometimes you'll get like to a seventy five percent activity output, or maybe it's fifty, maybe it's zero. And the thing is, you need to learn, like I've learned, you have to learn to be comfortable with, with that. You know what I'm saying? There's so much pressure that mm -hmm. you put on yourself with this, like, ah, I, like I, I didn't make target this month or whatever the case is. But really it's like, well, how many inputs did I deliver in a given month, on a given day, in a given week? And, and even if I don't meet that target, I should be okay because that was my best for that moment. I love that, Matt. That was so, yeah, you said so much there that, and so I want to just comment on yeah. a couple of things. This is what I see in the challenge. So people have these super high goals when they come in, like their goal might be, um, and, and everybody has different things. Like some people just want to better their confidence. Um, they want to reduce their fear. Those are really important goals. Some people have like number goals, like they really want to use go for no to increase their sales, increase their production. So their goals were, and, and their expectations, their personal expectations are really, really high for themselves, but their activity is really, really low. And that's where the cognitive dissonance comes in. So they become frustrated mm. because they're not, they're, they're going for yes. They want to do a little bit of activity, just a little bit of activity, and they want to have the yeses be easy and they want to have them frequently, um, but simultaneously they have these really high expectations. So to your point, they go to bed mad, they go to bed frustrated, they go to bed feeling less than and kicking themselves and putting themselves down. Where in Go For No, we teach, focus on your behaviors, focus on the things that you know move the needle, your activities, don't worry about the outcome. But I will tell you that it, we also say, if, you, if your head hits the pillow and you didn't hear one no today, you're not maximizing your potential. If you didn't hear one no, if either everybody talked, you talked to said yes, or you just didn't talk to very many people and you basically got nothing and you didn't hear one no, you're not maximizing your potential. Mm. One of the things, uh, like my previous business was in B2B. In fact, a lot of my businesses are, are in B2B even now um, with what I'm doing uh, with the Matt Brown Show is B2B. What I find is, you know, like if you're trying to sell a book to an individual, like there's, your sales cycles are way shorter, right? Like it's like I get to decide if I want to do this go for no book, yes or no. <laughs> yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but if I um, am in the B2B space, like if I send, or uh, I'm not saying this is exactly what's happening to me, but I, it happens a lot, um, where you're trying to get to a note, but you actually just don't get any feedback at all. You know, and you're sitting in this awkward thing where like, and it's always this thing, like how big is my pipeline? You know, is it a yes. million dollars? Is it six million? Because, you know, if I close on average 20% of my pipeline and it's a million dollars, I'm making 200K a month. Um, so, and, you know, and when I close that 20K, I, if I can top it up again to buy another 200K, then the cycle keeps going. So my run rate every month is 200K. Problem is that pipeline tends to go north and your conversion rates don't necessarily go north with it. Um, and the reason for that, the experience is, is like you just don't get a no at all. You just get ignored. Like people get busy, and especially in B2B, there's multiple people making the decision. It's not just like Matt Brown trying to buy Andrea Waltz's book. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so you sit in this shitty feeling. It's like I'm not even getting to a no, dude. Like I'm actually – it's the thing – that happens before the no, you know what I mean? Like I'd be great to get to a no even better if I get to a yes, but you see, like 80% of it is this awkward silence, you know, where you don't get feedback. Like what's your advice to uh, a salesperson in B2B entrepreneur trying to build a B2B uh, business dealing with this 80% of silence? 
Yeah, I'm where, right there with you. I totally get it. I mean, that is, I, I live that as well um, because I'm in B2B fundamentally myself. So for me, it's about focusing on what you can control, which is your own behavior. And at that, on those moments where you have that si silence and you look at your pipeline and you go like, there's all this opportunity. I got a couple no's, great. I can move those people either out or I can just have them on a drip list, follow up with them, great. I got a couple yeses, great. Um, staying even keel is really important. The thing is to not interpret the silence as a no, which I think a lot of us do, and to be relentless in your um, and patient at the same time. Understanding that a lot of the deals that you have in your pipeline will convert. You just have to be patient and you have to focus on continuing to fill that pipeline. You can't just sit around and wait for that the the what you have in your pipeline now to convert. You've got to keep filling it, keep working it, understanding that some of those deals will end up being a no or they'll go nowhere. You'll never hear from them again. And some of them will convert, but it's going to take you following up, being being positively persistent, but being relentless, like not giving up. And they might convert a year or two or three later. And I've experienced this. I mean, I've been in, an entrepreneur now for like 24 years, and I've had companies on my list and deals that I've been interested in 14 years, nine years, finally got a yes. Um, I'm, I'm patient. I'll wait forever because I know this, this prospect, this company is qualified. And so it's just up to me to stay engaged, but I also know I can't rely on that. Yes. That, you know, I would love it to close now, but that's my timetable. They're going to take theirs. So I just have to do what I can, which is to continue to reach out, connect with more people and just keep filling that pipeline. Mm. So um, when you get a no, though, I, I actually think like a no is also an opportunity, right? In the sense of, you know, I think many of us just like uh, the, uh, this person said, no, screw them. You know, I can't believe they didn't see how awesome I am. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Like, how did they choose that speaker over me? Come on, I got more Amazon five star reviews than them. <laughs> I, say, I say it all the time. <laughs> I know, right? Exactly. <laughs> But, you know, but I think the thing is, is like, you shouldn't just accept the fact, well, my perspective is you shouldn't just accept the no for being no and you, and, and you bail. Like, I think there's, you know, let's just say you get 10 no's. I still think you can commercialize 20% of those no's if you have an offer, right? That's maybe not the big ticket thing. So let's just t talk about you as a, sp as a hypothetical, you, uh, you're charging, you know, 20, 20 grand for, for, for a keynote, you get a no. So instead of that, you have like an online course, right? That's, you know, two and a half grand per seat. So you have that. So you get the no for the big ticket, but you know that there's, you know, a thousand salespeople for Oracle. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So, so you have a, an offer that's, you know, it, you change the context of the no. I think that's a really powerful thing. Like um, if you don't want Matt Brown as your fractional chief uh, media officer, you know, like here's a whole bunch of thought leadership content. You know what I'm saying? Like it's still in the wheelhouse of what you're doing, but it's a lower ticket. And if you, and you're shifting the context of the no. And I think, you know, from like a, a 20 grand keynotes to a two and a half grand training library that is on demand, accessible for the whole year, you know, now the whole narrative has changed. And I think, you know, as entrepreneurs, even I've been guilty of this, it's like you just take no and you go, oh, screw it. You know what I mean? You're not yeah. thinking about like, well, strategically, how can I change this context so that I can get to the yes? Absolutely. And that's a whole, I mean, there's so much to unpack with when you get a no and what to mm. do with it. And so like, theoretically, we always say, um, when you get a no, think of it as a gift. Think of it like, okay, what am I going to do with it? And I like what you said about like, it is strategically what can you offer if your goal is to help this person do X, Y, and Z, what can you offer instead? How do you stay engaged? How do you not just run away and assume like it's no for never and uh, no, never. Um, and sometimes it is, which is great because that saves you a lot of time as well. But sometimes we don't know what the um, objection is and you can certainly, depending on your relationship with the person, you can certainly ask. That's one avenue, which I like, but that that may or may not work. And it depends on the context. Oftentimes, um, like I've tried that over email and oftentimes I won't get a response. If I'm 
on the phone with somebody, if I'm talking with somebody, it could be a little bit easier to ask them, you know, well, what made you say no? Because I thought this was perfect and it seemed like the timing is right. So, you know, why are you saying no right now? So you can get that objection, get that no, and then figure out, okay, how can I help this person? But to your point, if you get the no and there's other things that you can offer, the first thing you want to do is just stay positive. Like, don't think, okay, this is the end. Take it personally. I'm going to get frustrated or I'm going to get dis depressed or disappointed. That's why nobody in sales gets no's. If people knew that salespeople wouldn't, because everybody knows everybody's human, right? So we know, we know that when we give somebody a no, they're going to be disappointed. We don't want to disappoint people. They, we know that, hey, we just took money out of their pocket. Nobody likes to do that. Nobody wants to be mean. Um, so it's just easier. We're, we're really protecting ourselves by not giving that person the no. But it's so much kinder, right? It's so much kinder. And to maybe even explain why. So instead of pulling back, though, as the sa on the sales side, instead of putting, pulling back, it's kind of like, okay, totally understand. Like, be positive, but stay engaged. So... Um, if that doesn't work for you, and, and it could be um, that budget's an issue, it could be timing's an issue, um, do you mind if I stay connected with you and, and follow up in six weeks just to see if anything's changed? Like, how can we stay engaged with that person to take that next step or make that offer right there? So there's so many avenues, Matt, you just have to think through your um, your customer and how best you can serve them in that moment. And and test and try things. That's what I do. I, I'm always testing and trying new responses, new approaches to see you know, what works. And sometimes sales is an art. So sometimes what works for one doesn't work for somebody else. And that's just the way it goes. Mm -hmm. There's yeah, I love it. And the other thing also um, is like, you know, you don't have to sell them something it, all yeah. the time. You know what right. I mean? Like, um, you know, like, why don't you give them something? Yeah. Instead, you know what I mean? Like, here's so a like free audio, here's a whatever that can help you. Just like, I think so everyone's just trying to make money. It's like, we're in this, you know, capitalistic society. And it's like, you know, how much can I make? And how fast can I make it? How fast can I get to a million dollars? Like, that's my thing, you know, because mm -hmm. if I don't get there, like, I'm not successful and whatever the, the narrative is, right? Um, and you know, like even with, with me, like with what I'm doing with the map round show. So like I do a shit ton of free stuff. So like I'll interview startup founders, you know, and say, Hey man, you're doing amazing things. You've raised 2.5 million. Uh, you know, why don't you come on the show? I'm doing the series It's called, you know, built in California, built in New York, built in Texas or whatever. So it's a way for me to give them the experience of working with me uh, even you, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you have this experience now that's tangible. Whereas if I mailed you, Andrea, and I said, hey, I'm a fractional chief media officer and I'm a podcast guy and, you know, like you don't get it. You know what I'm trying to say? Oh, yeah. You don't get it. And I think this is the thing. I think if you can give your prospect like the experience before they buy, like it's, it's a way better smarter way i would say strategically to one build a relationship where like you don't sound like the other 10 you know sales dudes that try to pitch me i get this a lot by the way like so people um this is uh, there's a thing you probably have seen this or maybe haven't but basically there's these companies and it's like a it's a syndicate right so <laughs> what they do is they come they, they mail you and they go hey matt um you know i know you're the ceo of blah um uh, you know we would like to feature you in the top 10 uh, entrepreneurs to watch in technology. And we have a magazine thing and, you know, it's going to cost you like two and a half grand. Mm -hmm. I don't know where you've seen that. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then, and it's, it's like this weird PR thing. And then if, you know, like you do the one and suddenly it's like, you know, you're like on the hit list, right? Now it's about upselling this guy. Um, and I get a lot of startup founders who've said to me, like, Matt, like there was something about like the way that you engaged us where it, we just had to actually, we had to actually talk to you because you don't sound like a PR firm, you know, who doesn't understand technology wants to, you know, you must drop $12,000 a month for PR. Um, and like, there was just something about like the way that you engaged us. And it was because I'm not trying to sell you in step one right. you know what i'm trying to say yeah. and i think it's like 
so you're not even like the no hasn't even happened yet but you want you almost want to like get to that yes and get fewer no's to get to the yes you know what i'm saying so I'd rather have like five no's and then a yes than 20 no's and one yes you know what i mean mm-hmm. so so it is this this uh, approach of like giving first um, and demonstrating that you're not just trying to commercialize a relationship that you actually care you really care about right. this outcome yeah and i think having that i call it this is this is from my co-author ray higdon um posture it's having a posture which is i'm totally okay with and this is from weldon long actually he's a sales trainer he always says no is a perfectly acceptable answer when you have that posture and people feel empowered to say no which they already know they can say no i mean you aren't giving them permission to do that but when it's obvious and when when people can feel it all of the pressure comes down and then they're willing to be more open-minded to take a look at what you have and they don't feel like oh this person's just trying to get the fast yes they're just they all they care about is the yes so how you approach obviously is really important and you found a way to do it and that's exactly what i'm talking about with with testing different approaches in different ways Mm. yeah i mean in the last month six weeks i would say i've probably pivoted nine times i was this big media thing you know like you're you know, like massive big blah blah um and like rewrote copy rewrote positioning and i was just getting like yeah no you know mm. so, i don't know and then then suddenly it was like oh, really but that's exactly it. and then suddenly the conversation's now changing you know to like so now you found your positioning um and then it's about like the system that gets you to where you need to go so so like my thing is like you don't if you want to make a million dollars like you never rise to that level it's everyone sets these goals most of us don't get there but you always fall to the level of your systems right so it's mm-hmm. about that system of getting to the no that uh, whether you're giving something away for free or whether you have a down sell or an up sell or a cross sell or maybe whatever it might be or you have something to change the context like it's the system right that gets mm-hmm. you to to that no so i want to quickly double down on this what's the like worst no you've ever received Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, it turned out to be the best no we ever received. At the time, it was a really, really big New York publishing house saying no to publishing go for no. It was probably like, think of the biggest one you can think of in New York. And we got a no from them at the last minute. We were actually standing over the fax machine waiting for the offer to come through. And it never came through. So we called our book agent and we're like, hey, we were supposed to get the offer today. You told us, and he's like, "Yeah, hang on, I'll, I'll, I'll call you back." He calls back, and he goes, "Yeah, they're passing. They said you guys will never sell more than five thousand books, so they, they just don't trust that it's worth their investment." And I mean, in our heads, as you do when you expect a yes, we are, we are already not necessarily spending the money, but we're already having oh. visions of like the, the book you know, at the airport and we're, we're seeing like all of these amazing things. And, uh, so that, that didn't happen. So that was probably the biggest, like to us, life changing. No, but as it turned out, it was like the best thing that could have ever happened. So oftentimes, and this is just true with, with rejection is it forces you to take different paths. So we just doubled down. We're like, all right, so if we're not going to be published by, uh, you know, a legit publisher, we're going to stay self-published and we're going to make this book even more successful. We were just like hell bent now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a great believer in self-publishing. You know, it's like direct to creator, dude, you know, like you go to Amazon prints on demand, baby, you know, I can write my book, edit it myself, you know, get like a freelancer on Fiverr to design a pretty cover, you know, yeah. and I self-publish it. Like, you don't need to deal with like these unless there's a really good reason for having a publisher like hey man we're going to get you into all like all the bookstores in the u.s like you can't do that on your own like that's pretty much (laughs) why i needed a publisher but otherwise i said listen you can we'll happily do a rev share on like the retail store sales but like everything online that's 100 percent mine yeah yeah absolutely and you know these days um it is a creator economy and I, and there's not even the stigma. I, I, I don't think anyone has said anything to us ever about, oh, this is self-published. Oh, go for no, it's who, who's your publisher. I mean, no, certainly no client has ever asked that. You know, they look at the book and they're like, okay. They care about 
one thing and that's themselves, which is exactly what they should care about, which is, should I read this? Should I invest my time? What's this going to get me? Is this worthwhile? They don't care about the external stuff. That's all what we care about. I know, right? It's like which part, like when you when you go to breakfast at Tiffany's, like are you like well comparing who your publishers are? You know what I mean? Like no one cares, dude. Yeah. Like really, they don't <laughs> care. Like get over it. It's like how fast can you get your like to your point earlier, right? Like how fast can you get that message out there? Like you have to be the custodian of it. So it's like cool. The book is one thing, it's one medium, but like there's podcasts and video, like there's written article, like there's so many things that you can Absolutely. do to to get to get the word out there, right? So. Um, cool. So a couple of questions and then uh, we'll wrap up. Um, so if I gave you the keys to the map round show time machine, um, and, uh, you could go back to the first day where you were like, Richard came here, was like, like, go for it. Like this is thing. And you guys started to like figure out this thing. Um, what advice would you give yourself now about building this go for no empire of yours? Mm. Yeah, so on that, uh, I would, I would tell myself to embrace technology faster. That's just my, um, and I, it's not, it's an identity issue. Like my identity is, oh, I'm, I really don't like to have to learn all this stuff. It's just, it takes my time. I, you know, and, and so I, so I had some big failures because I wasn't willing to embrace technology and sometimes I would be stubborn over like not wanting to spend a lot of money on on something that I perceived I could do not myself, but well, I'll give you an example, just a quick example. So um, this is, gosh, this goes back to like 2005. I didn't want to do one of these email services. Now, now every Mailchimp and Aweber and Infusionsoft, you know, all of these ma all these um, email services are out there. But back then they weren't as popular and there weren't very many of them. So I like had this company create my own system where people signed up for our newsletter and it was this whole engine on our website because I thought, well, I'm not just going to go to some service and pay, gosh, 50 or $100 every month and I don't really own it. Like I want to own my own thing. Well, that turned out to be a complete and total disaster yeah. <laughs> um, because eventually that thing broke and also when i went to build another website it was like completely i mean it was just a system in this site there was i, I lost probably ten thousand emails mm. um and so i i and i've repeated that like kind of i've just dragged my feet and thought oh i want to just do something myself like sometimes just it's it's that old tony robbins thing like success leaves clues just look around and just bite the bullet and do what is makes sense instead of always having to like i don't want to do it that way i want to do my way <laughs> so that that's the advice is just look be smart just embrace technology faster and look pay attention look for clues if you see a lot of people doing something in your space just do it because they know something you don't uh-huh great advice great advice <laughs> if you build it yourself mm. Mm. <laughs> i think it's probably been being built already yeah, <laughs> so exactly. If you if you're like a deep tech founder solving a hard science problem, like okay, build it yourself. But otherwise, everything else, especially in marketing and automation and stuff, and email, or even social media stuff, like most of it's been done. So, oh, uh, yeah. but um, but Andrea, um, last question for you: Why do you do what you do? Like, what gets you out of bed in the morning? I absolutely love the light bulb that comes on in people's heads, and I can literally see it when. We tell them that they can solve their rejection fears by getting more rejection. I love that it's counterintuitive and I love that it's so different that people don't think of it. And so whether when we're in person, I love to see those light bulbs on or I'm on a podcast or somebody will, will write me. We get lots and lots of feedback on social media and emails and stuff. And people, I love to hear, I haven't thought of it that way because, um, I, I know that that's game changing and that there are so many people out there who previously wouldn't have tried something, who wouldn't have asked for something, wouldn't have asked the question, who are building things, doing things, solving problems, helping people just because in their head they think the mantra, oh, go for no. So that's what gets me up is I, who knows what 
person I get to influence who could really do something maybe life-changing, game-changing, who could really make a huge difference, um, not necessarily sell the next widget for $100. That's great. It's great for them. It's great for their family. But I don't know. I don't know what um, person will ask something that could change, like, now mm. I'm getting really dramatic, history. <laughs> so I, I, I just love it. I just love shifting people's thoughts when it comes to rejection. Yeah, it's interesting here. Like, when you when you package an idea like that, like you don't know where it's gonna go, you know, yeah. um, and and you know of the like, even if you just took the <clears throat> excuse me the five thousand or four thousand Amazon reviews that you have, like you don't have you don't know like of those four thousand uh, people who've written the, like to what extent it's actually made a difference. Do you know what I mean? Right. And it's a, and even podcasting. It's like, well, okay, you, you know, you get 5,000 downloads of an episode. It's like, but who are they? Mm-hmm. You're right. Like, what, what did they take from it? What did they do with it? Like, what did they actually implement? And then what outcome happened? Or, you know what I mean? Like, what new, did, new choices did they make for themselves? It's a weird thing, isn't it? It is. And all you can do is just hope that, um, that that's happening. But... I think it is. And and so many times, I mean, think of all of the amazing experiences you've had in your life, books you've read, movies you've seen, restaurants you've gone to, and you, you leave the restaurant, you go like, oh my gosh, that was the most fun, best meal of our lives. And we just had like the, it was just great. And do you call up the restaurant owner the next day and just go like, I just have to tell you, like the food was amazing and the, the staff was amazing and everything was so great. You don't, you just kind of go on with your life. So I believe that there's a lot of people out there a lot of creators who are making creating all kinds of change we just don't hear about it because that's just not what happens i know and the one thing i'm going to take from this conversation andrea is uh, the short book thing <laughs> because like i've got uh, i've got two ideas like the four books like one's called um, how to sell yourself in 60 seconds like eight frameworks or frameworks to basically sell anything to anyone fast and I think that's a short book. Um, and then another one is called uh, Scale Nomics. It's it's about you know talking about like the obvious non obvious thing, but like um, how do you scale a business or an idea in in non obvious ways? You know mm, what I mean? Like I like, like that. the that's cool, right? Yeah. Um, I think the first one's a bit like, mm, but like I don't know. You never know. Who knows anything about how it will you know respond? But well, my last thing, Matt, because <laughs> you made a comment about we, oh. People asking you, you know, should I do a podcast, whatever? Should and people ask us all the time, you know, I want to write a book or should I write this book? And the thing is, it's it's don't always think about what you should do based on the audience or based on the external. Yeah, do a podcast, do it for you, do it for mm-hmm. the fact that you get to interview people, the person that you become because you're gonna do a hundred episodes or five hundred episodes. Write the book because not just for the readers, but write it for you. Write it because of what it does for you in the writing process. Sometimes I think we forget that. Mm. Uh, yeah, another thing. It's like if you want to master something, teach it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have I think... completely, teach and go for no has completely transformed um, yeah. my thinking around it. Yeah. It's, I think it was like, there's a better way to say it. It's like the wise man, uh, like learn something new every day or something like that. And then you must unlearn it. Or it's like, it's like basically if you write about it, you, you're not a master. You know what I mean? You're just like a, an expert in something or a specialist in something. But you have to be able to teach it to become a master of it because if the idea doesn't connect and people don't do anything with it, then it's it's not a masterful piece of work. Absolutely. Yeah, you learn it, you do it, you teach it. That, yes. that's, how you, that's how you finally um, have the greatest impact on you because you can see – what it does for somebody else and watch them learn it it's it's definitely the final level yes absolutely andrea it's been amazing uh, it's been an hour and 10 minutes flown by uh, but thank you very much for being here i appreciate you thanks matt cheers appreciate guys it. thanks everybody ciao ciao